Okay, salam semua and welcome for today's class. So today we will be learning about uh, is about phylogenetic trees and cladograms, uh, and also con how to construct a cladogram. But prior to us moving into the details, we will first try to understand definitions. Okay, so uh, taxonomy. I've mentioned this again many times before in our earlier classes, but again I'll repeat. So taxonomy is the branch of biology which is concerned with naming and classifying diverse forms of life. Okay, how they classify, how they do this naming, it all boils down again to characters. Okay, characteristic states again, like the shape of your eyes, the color of your eyes, and all those other characters. Now phylogeny is broken down to two parts, which is uh, in Greek phylon, uh, which also means tribe and genesis, which means the origin. Uh, and basically, it's about the evolutionary history of a species or group of related species. So what makes taxonomy different from phylogeny is, or, or the similarities is, it uses characteristics, okay? It can be more phylogenical, can be molecular, but it uses characteristics. What makes taxonomy and phylogeny different is that phylogeny tries to achieve to see how species are related. Are you cousins? Are you sisters? Are, uh, brothers and sisters? Are you father, mother? That kind of thing. Taxonomy looks into your identity, your profiling. So imagine taxonomy as to having your identity card about having to understand your personality, where you come in the society, your Malaysian or not. Phylogeny will look at how you are related to somebody else. Systematics is the study of biological diversity in an evolutionary con context. So what system, when people talk about systematics, it's basically uh, looking into both taxonomy and phylogeny. Okay, and it will help reconstruct the phylogeny and also classify species. So that's what I'm talking about. It includes both of these. So, bagian ni faham eh semua? Hello? Doktor? Ah, ya? Yeah. Faham. Jenis tu apa? Apa tu? Genesis. Genetik ke? No, 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 no. no. Genes, genesis, bukan, it's not genetic. Genesis means permulaan. Uh, so, I tak tahu kalau dalam Alkitab pun ada, tapi kalau macam Bible, salah satu bahagian chapter awal is terpanggil the book of Genesis. How, macam mana Tuhan uh, membentuk bumi. Oh. That is what Genesis is. Uh, dia bukan genetics ya. To the side, genetics talks about the origin of life. Not to be confused with genetics. Oh, okay, okay. Ah, uh, so when you mean by phylogeny, why it's tribe and origin? Because when you look at a phylogenetic tree, macam yang atas ni, you're talking about awalnya siapa yang siapa yang memberi uh, siapa yang macam kickstart lah di punya uh, apa ni di punya phylogeny tree ni. So phylogeny tree not only looks at characters and relationship. But banyak istilah ancestor dengan descendants guna pakai. Because you want to see siapa siapa from all of these nodes menjadi uh, apa nak kata, nenek moyang lah untuk um, ancestor. Who menjadi nenek moyang sebelum dia branch out kepada current descendants. Uh, Ashraf, oh Genesis muka surat depan dalam Bible. Yes, betul. I rasa Alkitab pun ada kan? Al macam muka dimah ke? Asalnya macam mana Tuhan nanti bawa uh, apa ni uh, Adam dengan Hawa semua tu asal-asal tu. Introduction ke doktor? Dia bukan just introduction, dia chapter awal, chapter paling pertama pembentukan bumi. Ah uh, begitulah Ashraf. Macam the big macam the whole big bang theory kalau dalam Alkitab kita dia kita akan tunjuk Tuhan uh, membentuk uh, apa ni syurga dengan bumi daripada bumi nanti dia bentuk awan dengan air daripada air dia bentuk haiwan daripada air haiwan nanti keluar 
So all that is genesis. Dan macam kita kita percaya yang uh, bumi dibuat dalam tujuh dalam enam hari hari peta, hari ketujuh tu dia dia Tuhan mengam, apa ni uh, relax lah pada hari ketujuh tu. But all that is written in our dalam kitab kita is called Genesis. So in this sense, kalau as dari segi konteks phylogenetics ni, macam mana istilah Genesis tu datang is because siapa asal usulnya. And then how did asal usul ni memang kita evolve kepada apa yang sedia ada sekarang. So the other thing that makes evolution uh, and phylogeny different from taxonomy is kita memang nak sebelum ni nak cuba tahu asal usul uh, kita punya genealogy kita ataupun kita punya um, uh, apa ni evolusi kita based on ancestor dengan kita punya current descendants berbalik kepada characteristics so apa apa pun with taxonomy phylogeny semua apa yang mengkaitkan semua bidang-bidang ni is still about characteristics. Konteks macam mana kita nak uh, analyze it is different. Taxonomy is untuk description, diagnosis. Kalau evolution, we're talking about um, characters yang paling um, derived and also ancestral. So bahagian ni faham eh? This one boleh tak? Can I move on? Boleh, Doktor, boleh. Okay. So, when it comes to phonetics, phonetics ni lain. Uh, it's a bidang which is not talked about very often, but uh, it still can be applicable. So, now, phonetics juga dikenal pasti sebagai taxi metrics, and it's uh, an attempt to classify organisms based on overall similarity, uh, similarity usually in morphology or other observable traits. Okay, so now, uh, what makes phonetics uh, macam lain daripada bidang yang lain sikit is that it will still look at characteristics, sama juga, but it's based on overall similarity. Alright, berbanding dengan ada yang lain, kita nak tengok karakter untuk untuk cuba membezakan satu species daripada species yang lain. Tapi this one is forming groups. So kita nak tengok karakter apa yang boleh uh, sort of group a particular organism or a few organisms based on a on a similar character or overall similarity. Okay. Uh, more of this example, saya ada tunjuk ajar kat, oops, sorry ya, kat mana, kat sini. It's in... Uh, boleh nampak ke screen saya ni sekarang? Ataupun masih tengok slide? Masih tengok slide. slide. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I share screen. Never mind. Uh, I've given another link on uh, on e-learn regarding a video on ditulis sebagai uh, phonetics, cladistics and phylogenetics right under lecture 10. You can see that and dia ada beri contoh to explain about phonetics untuk birds. So, but in so for for her example, she tried to macam get, gather a group of birds based on the order of say the beak and the claw. So that is the phonetics yang digunakan. So ini regardless of their phylogeny or evolutionary relationships. So it's regardless sebab kita walaupun dia tengok similarities, dia tak tengok dari segi macam mana karakter tu ancestral or descendant. If it's going to be phylogeny or evolutionary, the the representation will be like this, will be done in a phylogram or a cladogram. But in this case, for phonetics, usually in the form of cluster. So they use, um, they use numeric algorithms like cluster analysis rather than using subjective evolution. Subjective evolution macam case taxonomy lah for their properties. So again, characters dia akan tengok based on cluster macam ni lah. Uh, am I clear ataupun ada soalan kat sini? Hello? Ya? Yeah. 
Jadinya kalau untuk fenetik ni, hmm. dia tak akan uh, buat phylogenetik lah tapi apa macam mana? Jadi next oh, diagram. Phenetics ni is not phylogenetics. Phylogenetics, you will want to see a relationship of the characters. So dia akan tengok relationship. So macam contohnya macam ni, kita boleh tengok okay. Uh, the most related to the arthropod kalau dia branch is the tardigrade then lepas tu the, the kalau kita berbalik kepada ancestor dia at this point nematode is the most related to arthropod or tardigrade so dia tengok relationship sebegitu and it's usually presented dalam bentuk phylogram or cladogram so tapi dalam case phenetics dia nak tengok similarities based on observable traits. So, kalau DNA susah untuk represent dalam phenetics, memang dia kena observable traits. And it's usually in a cluster form sebegini. So, the uh, uh, so the the technique which is used, usually used for phenetics is using cluster analysis. Faham ya? Eh? Okay, Aida kata clear. If there are no questions within the next uh 10 seconds i i can move on okay so now we're coming into phylogenetics okay so a phylogenetic tree is a diagram okay dia memang diagram is more for like illustrative diagram that represents mewakili evolutionary relationships among organisms now this one is very important here. Phylogenetic trees are hypothesis, not definitive facts. Okay, so contohnya, uh, ada tak examples? Um, okay, so in this case, this phylogenetic tree is considered a hypothesis. But it doesn't mean yang, ah, ini seadanya dia, ini lah yang faktanya hypothesis you have to understand um, is is an approach where it is evidence based number 1 and number 2 it is testable by others so now in the case sekiranya they find a new if they find new evidence yang leopard ni example is actually not even related to carnivora they found a new character yang they realize it actually stands out so, um, this hypothesis then can actually change. And, that, and therefore, itu yang dimaksudkan, it is not to be taken as the fact. So, um, so anything that has new evidence base, meaning you have new characters, you find new fossils, you find something that's uh, new DNA, this one that can help explain the phylogeny better, it is still hypothesis, not to be taken as a fact. Faham ya? Is this part clear? Yeah. Okay, good. The pattern of branching in a phylogenetic tree reflects how species or other groups evolve from a series of common ancestors. So, dia berbalik kepada beberapa series. So, all is branching. And then at this nodule part, at the nodule part, the node, before it branch, will show that these two have a common ancestor here. These two shared a common ancestor here before it branched out. Uh, and even this point also, before it branched, this part had a common ancestor and this part had a common ancestor. So this is what I mean by a series of common ancestors every time they branch. Okay. In trees, two species are more related if they have a more recent common ancestor and less related if they have a least recent common ancestor. So, contohnya, in this case, these two species kat sini, um, these two, at this point, they had a common ancestor. Don't look at the terminals. Okay, this is, at these endpoints are called terminals. Walaupun this European otter nampak macam berdekatan je dengan domestic dog, notice that they don't share a common ancestor. Their, their, their common ancestor is at this point. 
So there was there is no relationship here nearby the terminal points. It was more distant. So what they mean by the coming uh most common and least common is that in this case the we the the otter and the dog they share a common ancestor here. So it's least common. But in comparison to Canis, uh, the domestic dog and uh, the wolf, Canis familiaris and Canis lupus, they share a more common ancestor here. Faham ya? So, when, if you have a more common ancestor, you are more related. If you have a least recent ancestor, you are least related. So, here, they are, the fact that they share a more common ancestor, they are more related. The fact that um, that the European author and the domestic dog share uh, ancestor here, so they are least related. But for the uh, striped skunk and an author at this point, they definitely are more uh, are more related because they share a common ancestor here. So that is what they, that point was talking about. Phylogenetic trees can be drawn in various equivalent styles. A rotating tree about its branch points doesn't change the information it carries. So you've seen those that are in a tree branching form like this. You may have also seen those that are in a circular form. A lot of this are done for, say, viruses and bacteria, and all. it's slowly in a circle, or those that bring all the big groups together. So, but what he's trying to say here is that even though it's a rotating tree, the branch points does not change the information it carries. Maksudnya, akan tetap sama. So, even this one, at this point, kalau kita nak rotate, so katakan domestic dog dengan wolf, kita letak ke sini, and the striped skunk and otter, kita nak swap ke sini, it's still the same. Sebab kita bukannya swap, uh, we're not swapping anything at the terminal points. Kita memang swap ke sini je. But the common ancestor is still the same. So, arrangement does not change. Tapi kalau you swap terminal kat sini, tiba-tiba tukar kat sini, that changes things totally. Because then suddenly they're not sharing, a co suddenly they're common ancestor pula. Whereas here, they show that it's, that it's a non-common ancestor. Okay? So, it's almost same like chemistry. Bila kita nak buat model untuk atoms dengan molecules, no matter how you change the, the view, as long as the bonding tak bertukar, as long as the bonding is still the same, it is still the same chemical formula, chemical compound. So likewise, it's like this juga. Okay. So that, that explains my point here. So these are the key points. Okay. So now to recap taxonomy, yeah. So again, it was developed by Linnaeus in 18th century. That means in 1775, I believe. It is a hierarchical system placing species into broader groups of organisms so kingdom is the most broadest followed by phylum and species is the most specific uh yang key ports clean ceremony is just cara kita nak hafal kingdom phylum class order okay you don't have to hafal this if you already know what is the hierarchy for this okay so now Linnaeus also developed a system for binomial nomenclature so, tahu, ingatkan apa tu binomial nomenclature. Nomenclature is nama, binomial means two. So, this is a two naming system. It is a genus and a species. All organisms are given two-part Latinized names. Contohnya macam Panthera pardus. The genus is first, is the first name and is capitalized. First name and P is the capital. The species is the second name, pardus. And it's also italics. So this part very straightforward, kan? Shouldn't be very problematic. So, again, taxonomy only looks at hierarchy from uh, and classification of the from kingdom all the way down to its species. So, the commonalities here is it looks at characteristics. So, what this is trying to show all these colored-colored boxes here is you're trying to show all the different characters that comprises um, that comprises in this particular hierarchy. So if you notice, 
the higher you go up the hierarchy, the least characters that are most common. Alright? The moment you go to animals, yeah, there are a bit more characters that you can share. And further down. But the moment you go higher up, memang there are lesser characters that you can find which are more common. Okay? So basically, this is what taxonomy does. It groups you based on those characters. That is how it's different. You're not seeing any relationship. So this is what I mean by your identification. It gives you a more detailed um, work of your identification. Phylogenetic trees reflects the hierarchical classification of taxonomic groups nested within more inclusive groups. So now, having to bring all these important characters, what it will try to do is it tries to see the profiles of all these other organisms and tries to see what characters are more shared and are most uh, ancestral. That is what phylogenetic does. Okay, so then cladistics is basically creating a phylogenetic tree based on each branch point. This is the branching part, and this is the points. Represents the divergence or splitting of two species, sometimes can be more, from a common ancestor. So this is the common ancestor here before they split. Anatomical traits that appear as dichotomies or two-way branching points. Okay, so basically what you're trying to say here is that kalau you were to represent this uh, in a cladistic form, it will show branching points like this. Okay, um, so far before I move on, are we quite clear? Five seconds. Okay, everyone's clear. So now a cladogram is a tree constructed from a series of dichotomies or two-way branching points that represents divergence. See what I said? The deeper the branch, the greater the divergence. Okay? So meaning to say, um, what do you call this? dear, if it's deeper in this sense, this is more diverted. Okay, the sequence symbolizes historical chronology. So when you're talking about historical chronology, um, if in this point, we can see that the wolf would have uh, probably appeared fierce at first, okay? And then while uh, after the wolf has, um, what do you call this, drive at this point, it formed in its own uh, descendants, but some have also branched out here and evolved to a point that they've they have also split to evolve into leopards and then later the domestic cat. So at this point, the wolf is more ancestral, and then later on came about the leopard, and then the domestic cat is the more evolved in comparison. Okay, so that's what he mean by historical chronology. Wolf, lepas tu leopard, and then domestic cat. Are we clear here? Five seconds. One, two. Cool. Any point you tak faham, please, you can, you can stop me. So the sequence symbolizes historical chronology. Clades are where each branch is a cladogram, ancestral species, and all of its descendants. So cladogram will always represent these are the descendants, okay, and then these ones are called the uh, ancestors, okay. At any of the branching points also, they are considered ancestors. Okay, coming to cladistics. Various branches in a cladogram indicate a clade. From the Greek word kledos or means branch. So this is a branch, this is a clade, and then this is a clade, this is a clade, and this is a clade. So how many clades can we see here? You can't, this is not, it's, this one cannot be its own clade, okay? So this is one clade, then this is a second clade, this is a third clade. Uh, and if you were to include the outgroup also, 
And at this point, this can also be considered a clade. So it consists of an ancestral species and all of its descendants. So that is what makes a clade. Okay. So uh, in this case, you in this case at this point, this is already a terminate point. This is already the descendant. You are not showing the ancestral species. So this one cannot be considered a clade. In this part, yes. Why? Because you have both the descendants and then also the ancestor here. So that is why the branching point, if you notice on this, this peach color thing, it includes the ancestor at this point and both of the descendants. This is also a clade where it includes the ancestor and all of the descendants. Likewise here, this one is uh, an ancestor and all of these descendants. So that's what makes a clade. New branches or clades are designated by a shared derived character. Okay, so new branches or clades are designated by a shared derived character. So meaning to say, this character, retractable clause, is a shared derived character. It's an evolved character. This one, it's a non-shared trait. Because the ability to purr, it was found at this point only for the domestic cat. You don't find this character in a leopard, in a wolf, in a horse, or in a turtle. So that does not make it a shared derived character. It is a non-shared trait. So it is not informative because it is only useful for this species, Sahaja. It is not useful to explain relationships for the leopard and the cat, or the wolf, the leopard, and the domestic cat. If you look at this retractable claw, yes, it is helpful to, to know because this character helps explain the relationship of the, the common descendants of the leopard and domestic cat. Because at one point, the ancestor had a retractable claw, and that is why these two are related. For carnivorous meat-eating teeth, this is a very useful character to explain the relationship of the wolf the leopard and the domestic cat because at one point all of these three species had a common ancestor at this point. Okay. The backbone contains the shed primitive character, not derived. When you mean by derived, usually uh, it's the less is the less primitive. So the further out you are from the branch, it's more primitive. The closer you are to the branch at this point, it's more derived. Okay? Oh, okay. Sorry. All right. Um, so, uh, which, Shazwani, which point were you, are you confused at any point, Shazwani? Doctor, saya nak tanya, uh, yang macam, Cladistic apa semua ni kita kena macam berkait uh, kita ambil um, ambil kira jugalah sama ada uh, ada punya genotype and phenotype ke? Um, it depends whether the cladogram is representing the character based on uh, on phenotypic or genotypic characters. Oh yes, okay, okay. this one is probably uh, the most the most simplest because phenotypes are usually observable. But characteristics, mm -hmm. yes, they can go based on genetics. So, uh, technically at this point, if you're going to see sequences, they might actually show mm -hmm. at which point of your sequence um, is this point derived or this point more uh, less derived. Boleh? Mm -hmm. Okay, faham, doctor. Thank you, doctor. Okay, no problem. So, again, uh, a cladogram can look into phenotype and genotype. For the sake of this cladogram, we are actually using... Um, what you call this, uh, we are just using for phenotypic, this one so it is more observable. Okay? Uh, apa lagi eh? Okay, so for backbone contains the shared primitive character. So at this point, dia tu lupa nak tulis kat sini, at this point, I boleh contingkan. Lepas tu, boleh delete tak? Oh, macam mana, macam mana saya nak delete ni? Tu.
Oh, okay, wait. Hey, come on, Ani. Tekan back kot. Huh? Back? Tekan back kot. Ada tak back? Ke yeah, atau? I did. Ah, do hi. Oh, okay, 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 boleh, boleh. Uh -huh. oh, Alright, sorry, ya. I pun sedang belajar. Oh, okay, 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 fine, fine. So, okay. Let me, let me try one more time, ah. Huh? Jaswani suka saya conteng-conteng, eh. <laughs> Alright. Okay, so at this point, the backbone contains the shared character. Okay, so at this point, anggap ni sebagai backbone. So at the backbone is a character uh, that, which is the, where the common ancestors for all of these organisms, including the turtle, horse, humor, too, um, are are grouped together or this forms a clay. But this character of the backbone, because it's at this branch in comparison to this point, it's the most shared primitive character. It's a shared primitive character because not only is it primitive at this point, but it is shared among all of these current descendants. Sumo descendants ni sekarang ada uh, backbone juga. If the backbone was exclusive only for the turtle and not for the others, it'll be a non-shared primitive character. And all these terminologies of shared characters, I will ex that's why your plagiomorphy and uh, synapromorphy, I will come into practice. But right now, I hope you understand the concept here sebelum I move forward. Boleh ya semua? Hey, doctor. Thank you. Okay, chomil. Now going on. Ha, okay. So now, remember this. I will come to this point again. And then later we do a practice. So the terminologies I want to use here. Alright, the first is plesiomorphy. Plesiomorphies um, is a primitive or ancestral character state. Sim plesiomorphy is a shared primitive character state. Okay. So, prasan, both of these um, states, they are both primitive. But, plesiomorphy is, uh, is, what do you call this? Is not shared. But, symplesiomorphy is a shared primitive character. So, example in this diagram here, this one, kalau kita cuba ingatkan, this is the most, the least chronologized, this is the most, uh, Outside can compared to those that are more derived here. So plesiomorphy at this point, this what they're trying to show is the ancestral trait. Um, it's common here. It's only found here. Or it's only found in this character. Alright? So it's that what do you call this? It's not later on, this trait is not shared here. So that is what makes it um plesiomorphy. Now, synaphromorphies are shared derived characters. So, it is, it is, it's no more primitive and it's a shared derived character. So, if you look in this point, so if you look here at this trait, at the common ancestor part here, this is a shared character for both of these descendants. Outer permorphy is a derived character not shared with other species. Ha. Huh. So, it means to say that only this descendant has this character for the species. So, basically, that character is very species-specific for this one. So, it is, it is helpful to differentiate this species, say, from others. But it is not helpful if you want to understand relationships for other groups. So, that is what autopomorphy is. Homoplasis is usually related to convergent characters or they are analogous. So if it's analogous, a very common example which is given here is the wings of bats and birds. So wings of bats and birds, it doesn't show that they are actually the common ancestors. The wings, it's supposed to show that they are, are driven because of ev ev uh, environmental adaptation. 
that it's is the one and medium fried rather than a common ancestor that's split. Uh, so this is where homoplasis comes in. Okay, so now let's do a little quiz. Based on this definition, I want you to, to explain to me which of these are these examples. Okay, so for please your movie again, it's a primitive or ancestral character state. Do we have any examples here? Which of these? Uh, don't forget another one more here is backbone, yeah? So which of these characters are considered primitive for ancestral character state? Uh, saya cuba je lah. Yang dekat backbone tu kot. Yang mana? Yang dekat backbone. The primitive of ancestral. Uh, okay. The thing with the backbone is, you're correct, it is primitive. But it is shared. So, kita memang tak ada ni plesiomorphic kat sini. Oh, so, there's no okay. characters here yes, that is plesiomorphy. If, for example, um, they put a point here that says shell and then boom. But if you put anything shell here, for sure, sepatutnya all these groups are there. Unless you want to put it at one point here, so the common ancestor had to say a shell here, the past two, it's not evolved. Then you can see that character set is plesiomorphy. So plesiomorphy is basically like the opposite of autopomorphy. So autopomorphy is derived only for that species, but is derived. Uh, if the, in the case of the shell kalaka xini, it's a primitive and just only for that species sahaja. So now, anyway, good try. I think it's Aida, kan, yang buat tadi. Hello? Siapa yang jawab tadi? Aida, Aida jawab, Aida. Okay, clear, bagel. Tak apa, good job. Now, simplesiomorphy, shared primitive characters. Can anyone give me two kinds of shared primitive character? Character, not the descendants. Ada bulu. Cat. Eh tak. Ayah lah. Cat. Cat. Primitive Cat. character. Mana? Lopet. Apa? Lopet dengan kucing tu. Lepet lah lopet pula. <laughs> Kata bala. No. See ya. I said characters, character state. You got the descendants. You're not, when you say character kaki. state, you're supposed to explain whether is it hair, is it retractable claws, is it carnivorous state, no. not oh. descendants. Okay. Uh, this point is very important. So which okay. character state, character state, this is character hair, this is a character carnivorous, this carnivorous state, mm. this is a character. So which of the character state is considered shared primitive character? Uh, hair. hair, very good. And backbone, correct, very good. Those two are shared primitive characters. Okay, how about synapomorphies? Shared derived characters. Retractable. Retractable call. Good. What else? Ability to purr. Ah, salah. Liberation. <laughs> This one, ya ke tak? Ya. Ya. Yes, correct. So, yeah. these two are shared, derived characters. Autopomorphy is a derived character not shared with other species. So, which character is that? Correct. correct. So, see ya? It's a derived character, meaning it's towards the furthest end of the chronology compared to Cassini. And it's not shared with other species. That means ability to pony is only exclusive to the domestic cat. You can't find this in leopard, you can't find this in wolf, you can't find this in horse, you can't find this in turtle. So that is what autopomorphy is. Homoplas homoplasis is a convergent character. So um, this one, 
we don't have a good example kat sini but the example which i mentioned just now was wings so the wings of a bird wings of a bee wings of a bat if you notice they don't have a common ancestor because maybe at some big some very long ago in point yes but in a more common ancestor the bat which is a mammal a bird which is an avian and a bee which is an insect they are not um they are not related although they have wings so wings in this method for this animals are meant as a character that is used for adaptation to the environment not to show that they have a common ancestor do you guys understand what i'm getting at no okay what uh, what don't you understand fikri Yang lain pun tak faham ke? Syafi faham. Bagus. Fikri apa yang Fikri tak faham? Tolong tulis ke apa pun. Syafi faham yang hal lain? Izati, Zwani, apa lagi kat sini? Nabila. The presence faham of the... Yes. Yes. So, the presence of wing only for adaptation, not for clay. Okay, you have to understand, again, clade shows characters, but it also shows the relationship of ancestor and its descendants. So now the thing is, with, um, say, bats, bats, uh, birds, and bees, they are three very different groups altogether because... Yes, they have wings for adaptation to the environment. But then, look, okay, if you look at the structure of, say, the, the wing of, uh, of a bee and a wing of a bat, you notice that, that uh, what do you call this? For a bat, they have, um, they have an endoskeleton compared to insects, which has an exoskeleton. So the one, the structure of the wing of a bat is formed by skeletons, but the structure of the wing of a bee is actually more of a keratin protein. Am I right? So just because it's a wing, it doesn't mean that these three are probably more related. If anything, a bat and a bird are probably a little bit more related, but it's very it, it's if talking about commonalities is very far it's too way far out so it is more of an adaptive reason uh, adaptive uh, character rather than to show ancestors so we, we want to see something of this kind of relationship at one point the relationship because they are four-legged you know there's so many this is just one example but there are actually so much more characters this is just for the sake of an example but there's so much more characters that shows that the leopard and domesticate are so much more related, uh, say in the wolf and all. But bees, birds, and bats are too far out. If you want to say, if you want to say, at one point we are all related back uh, based on, uh, at one point a bacterial unicell. Yes, we all. If you really want to look at the evolutionary tree like that. But if you want to be a bit more realistic in terms of the common ancestors right now. Uh, birds, bats, and bees are way too far out. So its wing is considered more of an adaptive um, character rather than it being a common thing where at one point they shared a common ancestor. So that's why Homo is. Okay, another... I want you guys to give... Can you guys give me an example of a Homo for marine environment? Of marine organisms. Any ideas? Kata yes or no? Senang je. 
Ikan dengan ikan paus? Apa-apa-apa? Ikan dengan ikan paus. Clever! Very good. So, hmm. so in what sense ikan dengan ikan paus? Fisheries. Fisheries. <laughs> ikan lah. Tapi kalau uh, ikan paus kan mammal. Walaupun dia ada, apa, dia ada structure yang sama tapi dia punya uh, ada organ dia yang lain. Exactly. Perfect. Very good example, Amira. Amira kan? Amiza lah, Doktor. Apa? <laughs> Amiza yang jawab bukan saya. <laughs> Amiza? Oh, ya ke? Sorry, sorry. Okay, very good. Tak apa, very good example. Bukan saya. That's a, that's a very good uh, example. Good, good on you. Okay, so I hope these terminologies kita kena faham, eh? Because you have to understand, again, key points here is what uh, what defines taxonomy and all, is a, uh, taxonomy, phylogeny, all is about the character. But now, cladistics, character too are the value. So you have to understand this, the value of the character, whether it's a plesio, it's plesiomorphy, simplesiomorphy, etc. Because then from this, later can we construct a clid and faham whether the clade is a monophyletic clade or parapyletic clade or polyphyletic clade. Ha, that is where that comes in. So before we understand that, this part you kena faham dulu. All these terminologies. So if kita boleh anggap yang we all lah faham dah, I can move on. Sekejap, Doktor. Uh, boleh tak Doktor explain more dekat yang pisiomorphis tu? Saya macam kurang faham. Okay. Plesiomorphy, kalau sim plesiomorphy faham eh? Ah faham. Okay, so plesiomorphy and plesiomorphy are similar in the sense they are both primitive. So they are at the far end of your 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 chlor, uh, apa ni? of your phylogenetic tree. It's closer to the root point. Cuma what makes plesiomorph plesiomorphy different? It's like how autopomorphy is very exclusive for um, for a particular species. Plesiomorphy is actually an exclusive uh, character for for that uh, ancestor, tapi only for that ancestor. It's not shared. Oh, so basically they're just a uh, vice versa of uh, apa ni, automorphy lah. Cuma yes. automorphy untuk descendant. And then, uh, ah, ah, kan? Yes. And it's only specific for that. So, contohnya, contohnya. If, say, if this tree were bigger, and katakan, mm. other common ancestors, semua ada shells, for the sake of, for the sake of example lah, other, com, other common ancestors kat sini, kat sini, 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 semua ada shell. Only at this point, mungkin because from aquatic, lepas tu dia keluar ke terrestrial, the shell tu langsung hilang. Okay. So at this point, for hmm. the sake of this branch, the shell will only be exclusive for this species tak dijumpa kat tempat lah, kat, tak dijumpa untuk descendants yang lain. But the fact of the backbone, it's it's still at the root point and it's still found in other species, then yes, um, what do you call this? It's a shared primitive character. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. Okay, let's Okay, ah. so I rasa kita boleh move on if anything again, boleh stop me. So now, construction of the uh, the cladogram. So now for homology is the biology where likeness is attributed to a shared ancestries. So in this case, when you're talking about um, shared characters, the shared derived characters, which they are all homologous. So you perasan tak? Yes. You would think, how is it a human is actually related to a, bee, a bird? How is it even related to a whale uh, and a dog? But the fact is that, despite this evolution, we are homologous because the four limbs actually is very consistent. So it is just evolved differently, but the four limbs is these three points. There's not three points. There's three types of bones are still present from the most primitive to the most uh, derived of us. Kita tak boleh kata yang human paling derived lah. Okay? We also evolve at one point. 
But all of us as descendants sekarang ni, we all share similar fallings. Just that the, the, the structure of it is a little bit different. So that is what makes us homologous. Analogous is not all likeness qualifies as homologous. It represents adaptive features. So a, a perfect example is the wings of the bad bird and bee I mentioned. Lah. And analogous is what explains convergent evolution, where species from different evolutionary branches may come to resemble one another if they have similar ecological, sorry, ecological roles and natural selection has shaped analogous adaptation. Similarity due to convergence is called analogy or analogous. So again, if you look at this, so imagine now this, this is the bird, yeah, uh, this is a, the limb of a bird, yeah, and this is what forms their wings. You might find something which is also similar for bat. But if you look at the structure of a wing of a bee, the bee, you won't find a skeletal structure like this. So that is why it is an analogous um, feature. All right, are we good here? If you are good here, okay, good. This, this point is very important so that I can jump into this point. Once you understand how characters are similar or, not, or derived or not derived uh, and shared and not shared, it is what helps us understand in terms of the cladding, the kind of clades that we have. So the first clade uh, that uh, we should know of is monophyly or monophyletic taxon. So a group that is composed of collections of organisms, including the most recent common ancestor and all those organisms and all the descendants are the most recent common ancestor. So when you're talking about most recent common ancestors, the ones that are most closest to the descendants. So when you're looking at descendants, you look at the terminal points here. So these are all the descendants, okay? And when you're talking about ancestors, the most common, that means immediately after this, boom, the most common, boom, the most common. This is, this point and this point are usually very um, uh, less common ancestors, lah, okay? But all at this point, the fact that you in, can include both common ancestors and also the descendants, summa terkumpul, this is what forms a monophyletic clade. Another name for monophyletic taxon or clade is also just, you can use the word clade sahaja. So good examples are mammals, avis or avians, birds, and geosperms and also insects. Okay, this is what, uh, these are examples of monophyly. The next one that uh, we have is paraphyletic taxon, which is a group composed of a collection of organisms, including the most recent common ancestor of all those organisms. But unlike a monophyletic group, a paraphyletic group does not include all of the descendants of the most recent common ancestor. So, okay. Again, what it looks at is common ancestors are there, but it does not include some of the descendants. Okay, so some of the examples is for dinosaurs, fish, gymnosperms, invertebrates, and some protists. Okay, so how this traditionally defined groups, this came about because of taxonomy. So taxonomy, of course, you look at character, you look at observable characters. So you would think that, oh, all dinosaurs, they look like reptiles, they, have, they look scaly, they the claws, and yada, yada. So we group them all as dinosaurs. But then, some of those species within dinosaur, if you look more into uh, more details into the characters in terms of the relationship, and then if you also include the genotype, you realize that, hey, some of these are not being included. So there, there's, at what point maybe the character, the character of the common ancestor is not found in a descendant. Because anything that you share a common ancestor, the character of a common ancestor, should be present in the descendant. But if you're not finding it, then this will not include it in the group. 
So in this case, say example, for ability to blur is as specific to domestic cat. But don't forget, for the common ancestors for this cat, for this, this, and this, all of these characters are still found in domestic cat. So, but in comparison to this point, paraphyletic is, at this point when we assume that this species came from a common ancestor, but then when you look at the character of the common ancestor, hey, you're not finding it in this species. Uh, then there's some, not say something wrong, but that is why the hypothesis sometimes cannot be always accepted because when you look, start looking at the details of relationship, you see that the character from the common ancestor is not found here in the descendant. So that's why there's a lot of debate for the groups of the dinosauria because a lot of this the, yeah, from the fossil records, etc., are probably not found in the current species and the, sorry, the descendants. Okay. Then the next is polyphyletic. So polyphyletic is a group composed of a collection of organisms in which the most recent common ancestor of all the included organisms is not included, usually because the common ancestor lacks the characteristics of the group. Polyphyletic taxa are considered unnatural and usually are reclassified once they are discovered to be polyphyletic, usually reflects convergent evolution. So example, marine mammals, bipedial mammals, flying with the bris, etc. Okay, so Fikri, in order to answer your question this now about the presence of wings and birds, so this is an example. If you were to use wings as a character and you start plotting a graph based on other characters, you will most likely see, um, okay, the bat might form here, the bird might form here, and insects might form here. So at one point, yes, maybe at one long point, you can find a common uh, ancestor here, but it's the least common compared to a sh shared common ancestor here. So much so that this group, like say the insects, evolved to be its own kind. Whereas the birds and the bees, uh, sorry, the, the bat and the bird are probably a little bit more common because yes, their wings are made of limbs, but there's so many other characters that made bats form more closely related to mammals and then birds are its own group altogether. So that is why um, you can't share the common ancestors anymore for, for this, for the bird, for the bat, the bird, and the bee. So that is, so for anything to do with a polypilotic clade, it's because uh, of the character which is analogous. Analogous are also homeoplasies. Okay, those things you have to faham. So another good example here, which explains uh, the hypothesis of how the how these groups came about. Um, I took this from Wikipedia. So the cladogram of vertebrates. So vertebrate is one character that yes, we can pull all of these uh, of these different groups together. So now a good example here, what forms a monophyletic taxon? Again, uh, technically, anything from the root point and includes everything this is also a monophyletic clade. Anything that starts at the root of the point of the node that includes a common ancestor and all of the species and all of the descendants, it's considered a clade or monophyletic taxon. So if you even if you start here, all these can be considered monophyletic. But if you go further down, you want to see how more related the organisms are. So you're going to get a little bit different lah here. So the one in yellow. If, if you include all this, is the group of reptiles and birds contains its most recent common ancestor and all of the descendants of the ancestor. So the ancestor at this point, okay, they, they were all, uh, they all amniota, meaning to say that uh, uh, they had a character of amniotics. They have a uh, amnion, all right? So all these are still found in that. A parapalactic toxin, which is in blue, here the cyan, uh, groups of reptiles contains its most recent ancestor, but does not contain all of the descendants. Descendants are the ones that are terminal, yeah, hujung-hujung. 
namely avis so in this case if you want to include avis you has to have the character that not only found in birds but it's also found in all of these other animals so in this case you have the common ancestor but descendant tak ada a polypalatal group which is the one in red is a group of warm blooded animals so example the mammals and the birds but it doesn't include all of the most recent common ancestor and its members so you see all of the other descendants pun tak termasuk so because if you're basing the character of mammals and birds based on they are warm blooded then you cannot include reptiles you cannot include uh dipsida you cannot include the testid testid unis uh because they are mainly cold blooded so again what gives all these groups uh, all these different kinds of clades of um taxon it's because of the character berbalik kepada the character they're using in this case because they're all vertebrates we can pull all of these groups together but once you start getting further down it became becomes more complicated okay so are we clear for this anybody lost Okay, very good. Now, how one can construct a cladogram is based on a matrix like this. All right. So first, rather than you just put all the characters like this, first you have to list all the characters that you have uh, in mind. So yes, if you don't look at the box first, you put it as okay, hair, amniotic. eggs for walking legs yours etc and then put the all the organisms that you have with you okay and then when you're plotting this matrix you have to code it based on whether it's present or absent so kalau hair in a lancet of course is absent and yada yada so when you're constructing this clado uh, when you're constructing this matrix this character table the one that you see the least character shared you can put it towards the end lah because it's going to be very exclusive for that species the what the characters that you see that are more common are the ones that you can plot towards that is more primitive so a primitive character will show that uh, a a primitive dera- a primitive shared character is one that all of the descendants will have for sure And then once you start seeing like okay uh like this one has least characters right so you can put in terms of the chronology you put the ones that has most most characters outside the R group and then you start going down the ladder based on the least characters so that is how you plot your matrix lah in order to form your cladogram asy ni faham Okay, so I anggap semua faham. All right, issues with anatomy for convergent evolutions. Different species possess common. Uh, doctor, kejap, sorry. Ah, uh, boleh tak tadi yang dekat construction of a cladogram tu? Ah, okay. eh, uh, uh, macam apa nak buat activity yang cari apa mon mono apa tadi tu? monophyletic, no, paraphyletic and polyphyletic tu. Okay. I nak try buat. Nak tengok betul tak kefahaman I. You nak try construct? Eh, bukan, bukan. Macam kan tadi kan kita belajar pasal yang monophyletic, paraphyletic dengan polyphyletic tu kan? Yang this and one. And then I I nak apply benda tu dekat yang contoh kardiogram ni. I nak tengok betul ke tak kefahaman I. You nak cuba construct kat sini? Ah, nak apply yang tiga, tiga uh, okay. cardiogram tu. Alright. Ke tak boleh? For this example right now, um, if you want to apply, you will have to find other characters that you, macam apa ni? You have to use other characters that will not pull this together. Macam in this case, of course you're going to get a monophyletic, it's a monophyletic group lah. 
But if in mm. order for you to sort of do an example, apply contoh, I have I have to find a different example lah, macam activity, kot, untuk tengok. So I don't have a particular activity for you now. I can try finding examples to see kalau you boleh apply. But I do have ah, an okay, activity okay. here or for case study to do for convergent evolution lah. Sebab sini mereka semua nampak sama, even for this one. But you also have to find characters that uh, do not, what you call this, um, what makes it convergent. So this one is going to be cases of polyphyletic. But in this group, let me try to find a, a, an activity yang you all boleh cuba carikan lah. Oh, actually, mm. I think I do have in the evolution one code that you can try. <coughs> I'll, I'll try to find some activity yang boleh buat. Tapi so far, kalau macam ni boleh faham eh? Ah, uh, faham. Okay. Straight, quite straightforward lah. Okay. So, this one you can do on your own. Case study. So, for molecular, so some of the solutions, like, okay, if you are discovering this for the first time without any pre-reading about these kind of things, you will think, ah, of course, phonet- if you're looking at phonetics, if you're looking at taxonomy, make a nampak lah yang boleh group sesama. But then once you start looking into details, then yes, you realize that, then you will start understanding whether these characters are convergent or not. So some of the other solutions that has helped um, improvise our understanding is because of molecular changes. Uh, so many organisms shed similar sequences of DNA and amino acids like polypeptides. So mutations, uh, which includes insertion or deletions of uh, those nucleotides in your DNA, this can occur over time. Okay, so as I mentioned, technically we are also mutants of our common ancestors. So databases and computer programs are used to assess phylogenetic relationships that cannot be measured by comparative anatomy or other methods. So basically, if you're doing this based on phonetics alone and just common taxonomy application or common taxonomy, you would think that these groups are grouped together. But then DNA actually helps see whether or not a lot of the species are very much related or not. So if you want to apply for alignment of segments of DNA, so this is what happens like basically if you have this, at one point you will have a deletion of this and then an insertion of this, and then yada yada, then this is what happens. So you have a case study here <clears throat> of four different species. Okay, and then um, where this one is the root point and then they derive into these two different species and likewise Cassini. So for this, they gave an example here of species 1, 2, 3 and 4. Okay, so... For those guys, for you guys who really want to do a test on your phylogenetic tree, whether on these three different hypotheses, basically you can play around with this. All right? Maybe you can quickly look at an example here. Again, like how I've mentioned this one at this point, your matrix is formed based on most of your shared characters. You put it as most the primitive shared characters and then the one that are least common you put it towards the end so you can apply this for nucleotides as well so basically what they did here is an example of species one two three and four you have all of these different sequences and then what you want to do is you want to plot at what point are they different okay so this is basically your answer. Um, so what it shows here, again, I would, uh, Ida, if you really want to try an example, then this is an example. Okay, so this one is a bit tricky because what you have to do is you have to play around with the different nucleotides and see at what point they branch. So you want, so when you meant, at one point, when you get your hypothesis here, where you have eight events compared to a, to an, a hypothesis of 10 events, this is the most uh, reliable, most uh, what you will use as 
okay, if you notice in evolution, we will talk about uh, most uh, like maximum likelihood or maximum parsimony. So when you're talking about those parsimony is that you're looking at the different, if you form this different hypothesis, how many events that is most, uh, that is less likely to occur in a comparison to 10 events. So 10 events mean to say that the kinds of um, assumptions you will guess based on the, based on these nucleotides is more compared to this. So this one is actually more reliable because you're getting less outcomes in comparison to this. So, so Ida and the rest, if you really want to give this a shot, maybe you can try, you can try your understanding based on this and see which of these trees you're most likely to get. I mean, you, will, you can get any form of these trees, any of this, and these are all, again, hypotheses. But again, you want to get eucleotides that gives the least, uh, the least, what do you call this, number of changes. In, so your outcome is supposed to be something like this. Like if you get, in this case, eight events in comparison to 10 events, then this is the most reliable hypothesis. Okay, so this is again another example. Another solution I was talking about regarding DNA uh, and sequences is also molecular clock. So using differences in the sequences of DNA and in protein amino acid sequence, it places the origin of taxonomy groups in time. So what molecular clock is, what it does is, okay, so now you're basing this, okay, if it's four chambered heart, four yada, yada it's based on an observable phenotypic character. If you're looking at this, of course, you're looking at DNA sequences. But what molecular clock does is, it also looks at the rate of uh, evolution of the genomes. So some, so a phylogenetic clade may show relationship, but it may not show how long the species evolved at that point. What molecular clock does is it incorporates time. So sometimes you will see under the under your evolutionary tape, uh, what do you call this tree, you will see a point here that will show, like say 0 0.01 or something, something to do with time. So that shows how long the the what do you call this uh, those what do you call this this those uh, nucleotides, not say the, the genome uh, evolve over time. Okay, and the number of nucleotides and amino acids substitution is proportional to the time that has elapsed since the lineages branch. So again, what makes um, molecular clock and evolutionary trees different from just a normal cladogram is that for cladograms, it just shows a tree representation of uh, what character be it phenotypic or genotypic, um, can, can likely occur. But what, what molecular clock and also evolutionary, proper evolutionary tree shows is that in terms of how the time. So in this sense, it will show the length, or that means the bird uh, evolved longer at this time compared to mammals. Like this case, now there is no, there is no timing. There, so that's why you don't, uh, you don't see how long it evolved. So basically, if you want extra reading, you can look at this phylogenetic tree and how to understand evolutionary trees, you can refer to this YouTube, it's very helpful. And basically, that's all for my class today. Unless you want to move to evolution, uh, the evolution slide. If you're happy to go with it, we, ahead with that, I am happy to continue that and then class kita akan habis sepenuhnya. We only have a classroom industry next week. So what do you think? Any questions? Good, Aida is good. The rest, macam mana? I don't want to just be biased and think Aida. I'm asking for everybody's opinion. Will it survive kata? Thank you, maksudnya faham ke Ashraf? <clears throat> okay, good. Shazuni faham? 
Faham tapi kena baca lagi. Okay, no problem. Okay, so I'm assuming everybody is okay dah lebih faham sekarang. Um, my next question is, are you happy for me to go on to the next slide? The evolution, which is our last class and then boleh habis. Cuma next week we'll have classroom industry. Are you all happy for me to proceed? Aida is okay? Aina, summa response. <laughs> okay, no.